everyone. I'm the chair for this next session, which I'm particularly looking forward to. I think we'll have three very interesting papers, and the discussion so far for all sessions have been very interesting, and no one has held back, and I'm sure it will be the same after this one. And so our first speaker today, we are very, very honoured to have with us the Honourable Robert Cavallucci, Member of Parliament, Assistant Minister for Multicultural Affairs, who will be addressing us on the power of cultural diversity policy. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to you all, and thanks for having me, uh, not only at this wonderful campus, but in this uh, extraordinary room. It's, uh, when I walked in, it felt like, a, like the Knights of the Round Table or something. So <laughs> I'm sure there were some, some equally important discussions as there might have been back then. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to coming down here today and uh, having a little bit of a chat to you about where the Queensland Government is going in uh, the cultural diversity space. Um, just recently, uh, right the last week of last year, um, we sort of did a bit of a soft launch on our cultural diversity policy. Uh, we'd spent, I guess, uh, the, the previous 12 months working on putting together consulting with our communities and um, pretty pleased with the end result. Um, the, the document, uh, which I might actually go through now, um, the document does form two, two pieces to the puzzle. This first piece sets out our, uh, I guess, philosophical agenda um, towards our, our culturally diverse communities and will be accompanied by a second document which we will release in the coming months um, prior to the middle of the year, which will be the action plans which uh, will deliver on the objectives of this document and that those actions um, uh, basically what each government department uh, and their behaviours and what they will deliver. So I might uh, just click over the first bit if I can. The, the policy document, when you open it up, this this is basically encompasses the entire first page. Um, it basically says our vision for Queensland is to provide a quality of opportunity for all Queenslanders so that each of us, uh, every person I should say, can participate in a strong economy and a vibrant society. It's, it's very much a departure, I guess, from previous policies of previous governments. Uh, we've, uh, and I, I'm actually pretty proud of the statement and what it, what it says and what it represents. It doesn't refer to a group, it doesn't refer to anyone, it refers to all of us as simply just Queenslanders. It doesn't refer to cultural diversity. But it says what our vision is, and that is to provide quality of opportunity for every single person so that you can participate in our society. So irrespective of your faith, irrespective of your ethnicity, irrespective of your colour, all of those things are irrelevant in this document. It basically says that we are all simply just Queenslanders. And I think that is quite an important point for us to, to try and articulate. Because how can you have a harmonious society when you tell people that they are different for whatever reason? So, underpinning the four basic, well they're not basic, but four, four particular outcomes of the government. Language independence, education participation and attainment, economic independence and participation, and community participation are the four objectives of the government, all underpinned, of course, by the most culturally responsive services uh, of any state government in Australia. When drafting this policy, uh, it was important uh, for us as a government to really take into consideration the Queensland Plan. I'm not too sure how many of you are familiar with the Queensland Plan, but it's, uh, it was a document, uh, whilst it was driven uh, or implemented by government, it was something that was uh, compiled from a, from a list of 78,000 Queenslanders who provided the information for it. Um, and in that document, there was some great, great ideas, great objectives about where people believe and want the state to head. So for the next 30 years, it's all contained in the document. It is in draft form. However, I felt in constructing our policy, it was important to really consider what the people of Queensland thought about where they wanted the state to be. And a lot of that included regionalisation. Uh, a focus of it was education. Uh, and so I've tried to tie in our policy document to the Queensland plan. Uh, we've uh, tried to take the initiative and indicate to, to business communities, uh, universities, education facilities of the importance that we would intend to place on the partnerships with those groups. 
Sure. So outcome one is uh, language independence. Uh, one of the critical things that we believe um, for our culturally diverse communities to participate really effectively in our society in every single way is just having the basic ability to, uh, uh, to articulate in the English language. It's not about um, diminishing the importance of the, the 220 different languages that Queenslanders speak, absolutely not. It's about saying, well, we really want you to participate in our economy. We really want you to be able to participate in our society. In order for you to, to be able to do that in the most fundamental way, we need to do what we can to make sure that you have the basic fundamentals of the English language, because that is ultimately the uh, main form of communication here in Queensland. So there's a couple of uh, ways at which we uh, in, intend to, to deliver on those. I won't go through each of them. I'll, uh, I don't want to bore you too much. The second outcome, uh, once again highlighted in the Queensland plan, is something that's really important to Queenslanders is education. Through education, um, there is no other real way to, to participate in our society to be able to get a meaningful, meaningful job unless we have a solid education and equal education for every single Queenslander. So coming up with ways in which we're going to achieve that, particularly with our culturally diverse communities, is something that is very much important to us. Uh, so we, uh, as I said before, we have a, we, we are developing our action plan, uh, which will really detail as to how we're going to deliver on those. But there's just some some examples and some ideas about uh, what we intend to do there or what we already are doing there. Economic independence and participation. Um, again, this is uh, as we see it as fundamental to. Uh, achieving harmony within our communities. And that is for our culturally diverse communities, irrespective of where you came from and when you arrived or how you arrived, none of that, none of that really matters to us at all. Um, but when you do arrive here in Queensland, um, or if you've been here for five years, what's really critical is that you participate in our economy. Um, as a government, we truly believe um, the, many of the social ills and, that inflict our society um, with provision of, of a job uh, those social ills seem to fall away. Um, so for us, having our communities participating successfully uh, in our economy is, is of utmost importance. And there's a number of different ways we can, we're going to do that. Um, small business is critical. Um, being uh, of a uh, son of Italian migrants, I uh, have a very good understanding of the role that migrants play in small business across Queensland. We, we are the small business kings, whether you're Italian, Greek, Lebanese, Chinese, Polish. Uh, there's not a building company, fruit shop, corner store, uh, you name it, that is not run by uh, members of our culturally diverse communities. We're such fantastic uh, uh, contributors to economies. We're so, uh, I guess, uh, entrepreneurial in thought, and that we have so much to contribute. All we need to be given is simply a chance, a chance to participate, and. Uh, we will do everything we can to make sure that happens. So we're very keen to support small business startups, and uh, hopefully uh, in the coming months we'll have some great initiatives on that front. Number four, and um, I'm sure which is probably most important to the fine people in this room, is community participation. Um, this is something that needs to be a whole of government approach. Because every government department affects um, people's interactions with their communities. Uh, for us, it's that frontline engagement. It's that. Uh, it's that. I guess that um, uh, that that point at which our culturally diverse communities um, interact with the wider Queensland community, and making sure that that particular piece of engagement occurs in a way which is. Um, meaningful in a whole series of ways. It's, it's meaningful to our uh, wider Australian community or wider Queensland community. It's meaningful to our culturally diverse communities because uh, uh, we believe through proper engagement, through the, that frontline community engagement, it, it breaks down barriers. It opens up doors. It makes all of us feel part of the society that we live in. <coughs> There is no slide on faith. 
and it's for a particular reason, I guess. Uh, as someone who, uh, as I just said, is uh, of Italian descent, I think it wouldn't take too long to figure out that uh, I'm Roman Catholic myself and um, went to uh, obviously convent schools and went to a great school in Brisbane called St. Joseph's College, Gregory Terrace. Some of you might be familiar with it. And uh, I have a, an auntie who's a, a nun at the Vatican her whole life and uh, my, my grandparents when they came to Australia used to, uh, my grandmothers I should say, uh, used to uh, uh, work at Villa Maria. I don't know if many of you know Villa Maria and Spring Hill and, and what it does. But um, So despite our background of faith and despite being involved in a, in a political party whose uh, you know, fundamental values are on the Judeo-Christian beliefs and uh, a state being and a, and a country being founded on those same principles, I'm also a very firm believer in the separation of government and faith. So that's why uh, it's not included in our cultural diversity policy. But I think the narrative that we set out at the very first page of the policy about referring to all of us as Queenslanders, irrespective of faith and, or colour or uh, ethnic background, I think that's uh, very important uh, for our communities to understand that it, it does not matter. We don't care what your faith is. It's, it, what's really important is that we all participate in our society. And it's really important that the wider Queensland community uh, accepts all of us, uh, irrespective of faith. Uh, so I hope in a very, very short, short uh, process you, you uh, understand a little bit about where the Queensland government's going uh, with our policy. Um, I say to people, um, some of you will like it, some of you will not. It is a document which is uh, not a welfare document. It is a document which is an economic document. Um, and. Uh, I guess that does reflect also uh, the, the views of the government as to how uh, we deal with our culturally diverse communities. And again, that is a departure from previous from previous views on it. So that's uh, all I have for you today. I uh, really do appreciate uh, your time and listening to me and the opportunity to talk to you about our policy. And uh, I look forward to uh, further discussions uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm not too sure if there was the format, if I am to take questions or not. Well, thank you very much, Minister. We'll have our next two presentations and then we'll have, have, discussion. have the discussion after that. So could you join me, please? In thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now pass to our next speaker, who I think is fairly familiar to us all, Associate Professor Arabitz. You know, two things about him in particular. One, he has been here 20 years, and the other is that we are about to let him go free as we are days away from his retirement, which is very sad for those of us who will still be here in his absence, but well deserved. So I now pass the floor to Christophe. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> My paper is Migration and Cultural Needs of Immigrants in the Port of John Paul II. Immigration is one of the, one of the most frequently discussed issues <coughs> of politicians, community leaders, human rights activists, activists, media, academic, social workers, and the general public, not only in Australia, where the subject is ongoing debate, but also overseas in countries which not only attract a number of immigrants, but also in countries exporting immigrants. There are conflicts between countries about immigration issues. Even this week, on the 10th of February, a referendum took place in Switzerland on the immigration from the European Union countries based on pact between Switzerland and European Union. In this referendum, 50.3% voters decided to void a pact giving equal footing to European Union citizens to the Swiss market. This created conflicts with Germany, the second of the Italian uh, large <coughs> group of immigrants to Switzerland, and conflict with the European Union. 
Men Krishna is a phenomenon which is linked to peace. It's related to interreligious dialogue, as migrants represent many faiths, religions, and spiritual tradition, as well as strongly related to culture by the fact of bringing different cultural traditions to the host country of immigrants. In the first look, we may have the impression that John Paul II had little to do with immigration. <coughs> However, among the social issues of concern of the Pope, there was also the phenomenon of immigration. And after careful analysis of his biographies, his writings, and speeches, the conclusion would be very different. I would argue that John Paul II was a migrant himself, although not typical migrant. Following examples selected by Di Marzio 2007, you can note that during John Paul II's first greeting to the faithful from the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica on 16 October 1978, he said, I'm now the eminences, the cardinals, summon a new bishop of Rome. They have summoned him from a distant land, distant, yet always so close to the communion of faith and Christian tradition. And he added, jokingly, I do not know whether I can express myself properly in your I, Italian tongue. If I make mistakes, <coughs> you tell me. Indeed. John Paul II can be called a migrant pope, the first in, in 400 years. And later on, he opened the doors for other migrants, referring to presentation by Mr. T. Martin. It was changed in terms of uh, composition of the diplomatic mission uh, between a between number of countries and, and the Holy See. And the papacy was also opened to other migrants. And next was German, and now as you know, it was both from Argentina. Uh, we need also to add to this a list of his many travels, visit to more than 100 countries, ability to greet people in more than 100 languages, a number of meetings with migrant communities in various countries, and his frequent messages and references to migration. John Paul II asked a specific question in relation to peace and migration. And the question was, how the phenomenon of immigration helps build peace amongst people? And his answer was, I'm quoting, as regards immigrants and refugees, building conditions of peace means in practice being seriously committed to safeguarding, first of all, the right not to emigrate, the right not to emigrate. That is, the right to live in peace and dignity in one's own country by means of a safe local and national administration, more equitable trade and supportive international cooperation, it is possible for every country to guarantee its own population in addition to freedom of expression and movement, the possibility to satisfy the basic needs, such as health, food, work, housing, and education, where, where the only other option is to emigrate. It is interesting to know that the Pope, in the hierarchy of rights, sees firstly the right not to emigrate. Indeed, this is, in my view, very valid point to note that this is natural that people should live best in their own country of origin. This point also fo focuses us to think why people emigrate. And the reason is that <coughs> same people are not able simply to satisfy the basic needs or there is lack of freedom of expression. This implies that the country governed properly and if freedom of expression is respected as well as all inhabitants have the ability to satisfy the basic needs, the process of migration would be very limited, unlike the current phenomenon of global immigration. This also implies 
that countries should assist each other less fortunate countries in helping them in providing the citizens with the like necessities such as food, health, care, housing or education. Similarly, a kind of pressure for freedom of expression should be put on governments which do not respect these principles. Although the right not to emigrate was listed by the Pope at the beginning, he states that equally the right to emigrate exists. The right was also noted previously by John XXIII in his encyclical letter Mater and Magistra, and is based on universal destination of the goods of the world. Quote from John XXIII. Without John Paul II's addresses, we can see a great care about migrants, visible in making the task of migratory <coughs> movements, or flows, as he called it, with full respect for the dignity of persons and for the family's needs, and that, I'm quoting, no one should be indifferent to the conditions of multitude of immigrants. That is broadcast in the media. There are moving and sometimes horrifying images of these people. They are children young people, adults and the elderly persons with emancipated faces and sad, lonely eyes. The campus that takes them uh, that takes them in often impose on them serious restrictions. The Pope is aware both of the place with and endeavors of numerous public and private organizations to elevate the district disturbing situation as well as the traffic practiced by unscrupulous exploiters who are bonded at sea on precarious crafts, people desperately seeking a most certain future. Realizing problems related to migration, the Pope believes that, I'm quoting, the work of, migrant, of immigrants can make a valid contribution to the consolidation of peace. Migration can, in fact, facilitate and content understanding between civilization as well as between individuals and communities. There is also, in John Paul's view, strong relation between cultural diversity and peace. The last annual message for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, 2005, <coughs> written by John Paul on 24th November 2004, concentrates on the phenomenon of immigration from the perspective of integration. Realizing the difficulties in defining the concept theoretically and in practice, John Paul II refers to the instruction Erga Migrantes Caritas Christi, the love of Christ towards migrants. This is a very substantial document per se, would be worth of detailed analysis for all involved or having interest in the issue of migration. However, at this point, I can only emphasize that assimilation leading migrants to to suppress or forget their own cultural diversity is rejected in this document. In, in his message, the Pope does not discuss, according to his intention, all aspects of migrants' integration. He only touches them. But he is aware, and he also believes that the majority of people are aware of the identity conflict in the meeting of different cultures and also sees positive elements in it. Noting the global element of migration, he strongly encourages individuals to seek, quote, the proper balance between respect for own identity and recognition of the of others. You know, in the previously mentioned document, Erga Migrantes Caritas Christi, both model of assimilation, which tends to, quote, to transform those who are different into their own copy, 
as well as model of marginalization of immigrants is also rejected. He suggests genuine integration with an open outlook that refuses to consider solely the differences between immigrants and the local people. John Paul II advocates a mutual fecundation of cultures in the context of <coughs> true understanding and goodwill. There is also a strong connection between migration and the dignity of the person. Analyzing the phenomenon of migration, we cannot, in the context of teaching John Paul II, forget that the dignity of human person is the leading concept. From this concept, the Pope notes a number of fundamental rights which should be applied to any discussion on migration. These rights, as John Paul II is them in his message for the 87th World Day of Migration 2001, are the right to have one's own country, <clears throat> to live free in one's country, to live together with one's family, to have access to the good necessary for dignified life, to preserve and develop ethnic, cultural, and linguistic heritage, to publicly profess one's religion, and to be recognized and treated in all circumstances according to one's dignity as a human being. The right to emigrate should be considered and discussed within the context of these rights. These rights are expected even in relation to illegal immigrants. James Easter, 2007, made an interesting point that in the ongoing debate on immigration in the United States, quote, both sides tend to view immigration as object, either as workers, as welfare recipients of criminals, while one side sees a benefit of the present, the others view them as a better. However, John Paul II's teaching was quite influential during the debates on immigration in the United States at the high, higher level, and his language was even used by the presidents of the United States, and uh, his, speech, his speech writers were very familiar with social teaching of John Paul II. It is important to know that one section of the fundamental encyclical letter Laborem Externus, written in September 81, is dedicated to immigrants' workers under the title Work and the Immigration Question. And there are also some important points of, of general nature made by the Pope on immigration. The first one, the immigration, is such of what is an old phenomenon. However, this historical phenomenon continues to be repeated and wasted today. The second one is the right of human beings to leave native country as well as the right to return. The Pope knows the right of people to emigrate and re-emigrate in order to seek better conditions of life, but, but acknowledges that immigration generally constitutes, quote, a loss for the country which is left behind, and justified his point why. This is the part of a person who is also a member of a greater community, united by history, tradition, and culture. And that person must begin life in the midst of another society united by a different culture, very often a different language. In this case, it is loss of a subject of work whose efforts and mind and body could contribute to the concern of common good of his own country, but these efforts this contribution are instead offered to another society which in a sense has less right to them than the peasant's country of origin. This aspect is well described and surprisingly 
not acknowledged by the experts the, the, the issues of immigration. It is not considered an immigration policy in particular countries. The third point is associated with the general assessment of immigration, and the Pope displays the true understanding of the necessity of the phenomenon of immigration. His expression is, I'm quoting, even if emigration in some aspect an evil, in certain circumstances, it is, as the phrase goes, necessary. This expression can create some difficulties in interpretation. However, it is clear that the Pope does not see emigration in abstract or generally as a positive phenomenon. On the other hand, clearly, he acknowledges that immigration is based on necessity of life for some people. It is clear that he does not encourage emigration, but he acknowledges the reality. <coughs> Di Marzio, 2007, goes even further, referring to section 23 of the encyclical letter Laborem Externus, and believes that, well, we might reduce that migration has been described by a Holy Father not as a good in itself, but rather an evil that has resulted from the very weakening of human nature that was part of original sin. This statement, although the letter uses the term evil, seems to me go a little bit too far to make the, the link with sin. It is rather unfortunate in my new translation of the old Polish proverb or maxim, if you like, which sounds much more strong in the English language. In addition, migration is also referred to Bible and does not have any such a negative or environment. Another argument is that the Pope would not advocate the right of, to emigration if this will have a link to concept of sin. Nevertheless, in generally, migration is not positive, but rather negative phenomenon. I had argued on a number of occasions that migration is not positive even, but it's a very natural, by, by very nature of the phenomenon. But multiculturalism as a public public policy, especially in this country, responding to the negative phenomenon and assisting both individual and the host country is positive. What the Pope is advocating is to prevent from causing greater moral harm and at practical level, quote, every possible effort should be made to ensure that it may bring benefit to the immigrant's personal, family, and social life, both for the country to which he goes and the country which he lives. Further, taking in the context of workers' rights, he is advocating a just legislation, a legislation that takes into account the rights of immigrants. I'm not sure of the time of it. Five minutes. The Pope does not make any distinction between immigrants living permanently in new country or those who are only seasonal workers immigrants. He requests that all of them should not be disadvantaged. Simultaneously, he is realistic in his request. What he requests is that immigrants should not be disadvantaged in terms of their rights in comparison to the workers of the country where the immigrants are. He is clearly aware of the disadvantaged position of immigrants and says that immigration in such a way must in no way become an opportunity for financial or social exploitation. And further, in relation to work, he does not accept any form of discrimination and explains why. The same criteria should be applied to immigrant workers as to all other workers in the society concerned. The value of work should not be measured by the same standards and not according to the difference in nationality, race, or religion. For even greater reason, the situation is constrained in which the immigrant 
mankind himself should not be exploited. All the circumstances should categorically give way after special qualification have, of course, been taken into consideration to the fundamental value of work, which is bound up with the dignity <coughs> of the human best. By saying this relatively long ago, 1981, the pontiff, in my view, contributed to the development of anti-discrimination legislation in some countries. For example, in all states in Australia, legislated did the discrimination area of employment on the grounds of race, including ethnicity, so applying to the majority of immigrants, is unlawful. Although the problem of immigrants' work is far from satisfactory solution, in practice, the progress made since encyclical is significant. Undoubtedly, the awareness of the issue is higher received social ac acceptance in many countries. There is progress in terms of legislation and social support for the immigrants. The note should be made on the Pope's ability to observe and articulate and suggest solution to the problem. For example, in this state, such a legislation was introduced in 1991, so 10 years after document published by the Holy See. The legal framework is important and the Pope accepted. However, taking genuine development, the pontiff also advocated the framework of solidarity concept uh, discussed yesterday and freedom. The Pope concepts of solidarity, I believe, can be also applied to multicultural society. He introduces the idea of valid exercising of solidarity, which exists when the number of society recognize, when the members of society recognize another person. However, he makes the distinction between the more influential and the weaker. However, both have responsibilities. The more influential has responsibility for the weaker, the weaker should not be passive and also should act. The members of society who are between the weaker and the influential should respect interests of all without any selfish focus on the own interest. In conclusion, I would like simply to quote the year 2007. The teaching of John Paul II on migration give us a frame, a legal framework, to understand this complex public policy issue. The legal framework <coughs> is rooted in human dignity and freedom, without which the human laws necessary to guide migration and the common good can, can never be correctly forced. Thank you very much. Pass to our final speaker now for this session, the Reverend Gerard Hall, Associate Professor in the School of Theology at the Australian Catholic University, addressing us on culture and its significance in interreligious dialogue. Pass to everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and the welcome, uh, Professor Crystal and William. Thank you for your uh, work behind the scenes. Um, so this was the topic I was given, and it might sort of actually, the way I do it, sound a little bit left field from some of the uh, other kind of presentation. Uh, if anything, it might tie a little bit to what Lucas began with us yesterday morning in the sense it'll feel a little bit in the philosophical kind of area. Um, I suppose the other thing I was, was going to say, that I've been at the Australian Catholic University for a long time now. I've never been at a conference where we've discussed the Pope so extensively. <laughs> uh, basically, I'm going to give you... Uh, well, Lucas says to me last night, he's not interested in people, he's just interested in ideas. Well, I'm interested in both. <laughs> so I'm going to basically give you a little uh, 
some ideas around creating a culture of peace, global culture of peace, according to, uh, to this scholar here, that most of you probably will not have heard of. Um, obviously, he gives the game away a little bit. He, he is a Catholic priest, but then he said he, he has uh, comes from Catalonia, in, in northern Spain, and he had a Catholic... Uh, Catalan colonial mother and an Indian Hindu father, and he was ordained a uh, priest eventually, but he hadn't really come, gone into the roots of his, uh, the other side of his identity. And eventually he did, he said, I went to India a Christian, found myself to be a Hindu and became a Buddhist, all that ceased to be a Christian. Uh, now, so just, uh, I'm not sort of advocating this as something we should all run into, but uh, the basic is to raise this question, like culture and religion, like we think, okay, I'm an Australian Lutheran or Catholic, or you know, but in fact we're, we're all kind of uh, much, it's much more kind of complex than that. I mean, in fact, you know, I'm English, German, Irish, whatever. Uh, and I remember a professor in the United States where I was studying, sort of saying, well, I wonder if American Catholics in so many ways, they're much more like American Protestants than they are like uh, Spanish Catholics, something like that. In other words, the question of identity, and we know today that there is this question of dual or multiple religious belonging, which obviously uh, is what Penica himself has got into. And again, not something I'm, I'm advocating, but the reality that our identities are incredibly, incredibly complex. Uh, well, there is just a little bit, really, from that kind of the book there on the on the right or your left, which is uh, cultural disarmament. In a sense, what Penacar is advocating, he doesn't use the word religious disarmament, but in a certain sense, that's what he is advocating. If we, if we are to create a culture of peace, um, and he's coming at it from a, from a, a mystical kind of approach, if you like, as a dwelling place uh, for wisdom demonstrates. I'm not sure how that's like in there, but that's basically what uh, the religious dialogue hopefully should be about. Um, I think uh, Bishop uh, Morris yesterday mentioned the importance of um, not just dualistic thinking, but paradoxical thinking, I think is the way he put it. Benekar talks about uh, non-dualistic thinking. If we are to, to create a culture of peace, to understand and love one another and all those sorts of things, we actually need to do that. I remember Richard Raw writing about we need non-dualistic thinking in reference to love, suffering, death, God, the afterlife, and sex. Pedicar puts it a little bit differently that reality itself um, is not reducible to the intellectual principle. It's not mind alone or sit or consciousness or spirit. Reality is also sat and ananda, also matter and freedom, joy and being. Um, so I suppose what he's wanting to say is it's sort of a mystical approach, if you like, but like whether we're talking about peace or culture or religion, we need to deal with it at the intellectual level, of course, but we also need to appreciate that we're dealing with, with something much more profound than that. that it's part of who we are as bodies, it's part of who we are as spirits, it's part of emotion and life, etc. If we deal simply at the intellectual level, well, we're not likely to get uh, very far. And um, Jesus himself, of course, taught dualistically. You cannot serve both God and mammon, uh, God and wealth. But Jesus also spoke very non-dualistically when he gave the Sermon on the Mount uh, as one example. Um, Christians, in particular, should have a non-dualistic sense of, an, of an, obviously, with reference to the Trinitarian God, God who is one and who is three. That's not entirely kind of uh, able to be explicated purely on the rational level. It's a mystical insight. All right, so given the time, we better move on to his, what he calls uh, his nine sutras on peace. Uh, that Penica, by the way, 1918, 19, uh, 2010, he died, and that was his last book, The Rhythm of Being. And interestingly, it's his first sutra. Peace is participation in, in the harmony of the rhythm of being. So, 
This may be interpreted as a call to non-violence, provided we understand non-violence as the act of respect for the profound dignity of all being, and not merely as the absence of resistance, force, or power. So I think that came up yesterday with reference to the positive approach to peace and the negative approach. In a world where natural rhythms are so accentuated by our technocratic and technological culture, we move increasingly towards social upheaval, psychic unhealth, and ecological destructiveness. The challenge is not to, de to de deny or oppress these limitations of our fast-changing world with its ecological, economic, and political symptoms of violence and disharmony, but to disarm them through personal, social, and cosmic transformation. Penica calls this the adventure of being, which is neither a linear process towards some preordained evolutionary future, nor a return to some mythical imaginary past, but an acceptance of the rhythmic nature of all reality, the very becoming or rhythm of being in which we are privileged to play a role. So secondly, uh, it's difficult to live without peace, it's impossible to live without inner peace. And this relationship is inviting or non-dualistic. Non uh, so when I say he's doing philosophy, he actually calls this the, his philosophia uh, parches, the philosophy of peace. So it's very much, uh, if, if it's philosophical, which it tries to be, it's sort of a mystical kind of philosophy, if you like. We all know that the outer world and the inner world are mutually interpenetrating, attempting, it may be, to escape the world of cruelty and violence by heading to a desert or a monastery. While some may be called to live their lives in such relative isolation from the world, no authentic spirituality can be founded on escape from reality. The monk or the hippie represents a universal call to contemplation as a way to inner peace. Yet for most of us, such contemplation is to be achieved in the context of thoughtful action in the world of commerce, industry, academia, family life, politics and all the rest. We are called to inner peace at the same time we are, called, we are asked to confront external sufferings and commit ourselves to the alleviation of unjust situations. In religious or secular terms, the saint is able to live in a world of injustice and violence without losing his or her sense of inner peace. However, most of us, not being saints, will find inner peace difficult to attain about an external world where justice, peace, and freedom prevail. So peace is neither conquered for oneself nor imposed on others. Peace is received as well as discovered and created. It is a gift. In religious terms, a gift of the spirit. Whereas we might fight for rights or justice, we don't fight for peace, we receive it. In Jungian terms, peace is much more a feminine virtue, emphasizing receptivity rather than a masculine one emphasizing imposition. However, receptivity does not mean passivity. While peace is received as a gift, we must do something with it. We transform what we receive, as in the Christian reception of the Eucharist. As with the experience of love, we are invited into a new way of being in the world, into a new relationship with the other, which requires ongoing discovery and the call to an ever new creation. So reminisce, you know, Emmanuel Levinas was mentioned this morning, like encountering the face of the other is in fact our, our deepest human vocation and how we most profoundly come to know and understand ourselves. Peace, like love, requires constant nourishment. In religious terms, peace is a grace, both a divine gift and a human responsibility. 
This is to say that peace is much more than a human urge, aspiration or desire, let alone a mere program of social or political action. In this sense, to use another religious term, peace is always eschatological, something never fully achieved in the here and now. And yet a gift that promises to break open and transform our current unsatisfactory realities. And of course, I guess we, we all immediately recognise that as being true. We, we know the rubrics of war. Emperors, having established their superior powers, enact a peace treaty with the conquered. While in the short or medium terms this may lead to a cessation of war, it does not lead to true peace. The vanquished rise again when circumstances allow, such as the Versailles Peace Treaty leading eventually to World War II and the rise of Nazism, etc. Even if circumstances do not allow the vanquished to reassert themselves, the so-called peace situation can only be continued by ongoing violence against and suppression of the conquered, such as minority ethnic groups. Peace is never achieved through the re-establishment of, of, of a shattered order, but only through the establishment of a new order, a new creation. Yet we ask, must not evil be overcome? Our problem here amounts to deciding who is the arbiter of good and evil. The answer needs to be one, with, tends to be the one with superior power and the most destructive military weapons. What we tend to forget is that victory is always victory over people who, like ourselves, are a mixture of good and evil. Moreover, even if we establish to our satisfaction that a particular regime needs to be destroyed, can this ever justify the extermination of millions who are already victims of their own regimes? And since victory does not lead to peace, we are only slowly beginning to learn that another, more radical approach is necessary. If peace was a technological problem, a technological solution such as military disarmament would be its solution. Indeed, this might be a good place to start even if we all know in our hearts it will never happen, unless there is a much deeper recognition of the need for a spirituality of peace. Cultural disarmament is concerned with this more profound challenge. It has to do with how cultures interact, how they perceive and live with the other. Now, if the other is the enemy, pagan, kafir, heretic or infidel, their elimination is the only viable option. Moreover, if one's particular culture is armed with both weapons and a sense of cultural, human, moral and or spiritual superiority, the means for elimination or suppression of the always less than human other is assured. Whereas military disarmament overcomes the first obstacle, only a realignment of what constitutes our human being together on earth is capable of transforming our misguided militaristic and competitive worldview. And this requires a move towards intercultural an interreligious understanding through dialogue and reconciliation. In this process, cultures and religions are disarmed of their deluded sense of their own superiority, along with their obsessive fear of the other. Very nice. Been there, close. Okay. Pluralism is the order of the day. Like peace. For Penacar, anyhow, pluralism is not a concept, utopia, ideology, but a myth. It describes not merely the way things are, but more fundamentally the way things need to be. If we are to ever learn to live together in relative harmony and peace. In political terms, pluralism is simply the recognition 
There is no single culture, religion or tradition that can resolve the world's problems, including its most challenging one of achieving pathways to peace. Even more than this, pluralism recognises our acute dependence on one another for resolving such issues. We need to divest ourselves of all colonial, imperialist, universalist assumptions that in inevitably oppose their own worldviews, often by force, on weaker parties, thus denying their insights as well as their dignity, a word which has been used often already today. In this regard, we are only now beginning to realise the profound sensibility of indigenous cultures for the sacredness of the earth, a knowledge we ignore it at our, our peril, and even at the expense of the future of planet earth. And speaking of um, John Paul II's uh, speech at Alice Springs in 1986 to the indigenous people, and where he really, yeah, in a sense, quite early on in terms of this new recognition that the indigenous people had this profound, sacred sense of the earth and the cosmos that, in fact, at least many of us in other cultures um, have failed to recognise. Clearly, while Western science and technology have their part to play, we also need to learn from other traditions if we are to successfully negotiate a peaceful, earthly future especially the traditions of the East and of the of now oral traditions. We might easily dismiss Panikkar's notion of, of mythos. I'd say, like, just quickly, myth, myth or mythos of Panikkar, mythical, um, it's, it's mystical, I suppose, would be another word. Uh, it's not, not mythical, but mystical. And so it's, it, it might be dismissed as a return to a pre-rational, even irrational perception of reality. Surely, reason, <coughs> logos, is the overriding principle for the right ordering of our lives. The problem is that reason is a lone shark in the ocean of human perception. As man cannot live on bread alone, Likewise, reason, though essential, is not the only requirement of human life and relationship. So when Penica refers to God, pluralism, or peace as myths, he's not denying their rationality, but invoking a more profound sense of their meaning and significance. Peace, like God, pluralism, civilization, democracy, or freedom, is a concept, but is not merely a concept. Reduced to concepts, rationality or interpretation, God and peace may have, in fact, have become reasons for conflict and warfare. There will continue to be rival meanings and interpretations of all such realities. Nonetheless, their mythic appeal is precisely in their ability to transcend ideological, cultural, political and religious systems. This is why, according to Penicar, peace is the eminent myth of our days, or the unifying myth of our times. We've already heard a little bit about this in the conference, but in the sense of religion as a way to peace. But once religion once turned into an ideology, ceases to be a way of peace and turns into an excuse for war. History is too full of multiple examples to offer any meaningful objections. Yet all religions, as we've seen in their own ways, claim to be ways of peace. Shalom, Shalom, Shanti, etc. Religions can no longer be comfortable with, with this notion of, of, of the religion being pathways of inner peace for their followers while being causes of outer war for others. Again, in their pluralistic expressions, Religions claim to be ways of peace for humanity and the entire cosmos. Even the new atheism claims to divest humans of their religious irrationalities in order to achieve peace on earth, if not in heaven. 
Consequently, today's challenge to all religions is to return to their origins and reclaim their fundamental identities as revolutionary pathways to peace through confronting human greed and overturning all injustice. And finally, only forgiveness, reconciliation and dialogue lead to peace and shatter the law of karma. I was thinking of Savage Garden here this morning, our own Queensland Brisbane group. Uh, karma, what? Karma, what you give is what you get. Um, so it's, it's a good shorthand way of um, Australianising that wonderful Eastern concept. But the way forward is not the way back. Millions have been killed, cultures destroyed, ethnic groups cleansed, enemies eliminated, injustices entrenched. No peace treaty, amount of compensation, degree of punishment, <coughs> requirement of a reparation or imposition of someone's justice can condone the violence, let alone achieve the desired peace. Human history is too full of what the religious philosopher René Girard terms the cycle of mimetic violence, through which people turn on the scapegoats to divest themselves of their own guilt. I know I'm right on time, and I'm just going to finish this little one. Thank you. For Pedicar, only forgiveness, gift for, reconciliation, bringing together again, and ongoing dialogue, depth meeting of persons, what he calls gifts of the spirit, are capable of piercing the violence circle of retribution, or shattering the law of karma thereby creating the possibility of peace, what he calls a new innocence. Here the legal model of justice is transcended, not denied, through acceptance of guilt, offer of recompense, seeking and granting of forgiveness, and recommitment to a world in which, in which such violence and injustice are never repeated. Justice is not denied, but mercy, which highlights forgiveness, takes the upper hand. Two imperfect but notable attempts to enact the pathway, this pathway to peace, of course, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and what we just heard was the anniversary uh, yesterday of the Australian government's eventual apology to Indigenous people who were forcibly removed from their families. <coughs> Penicar, only genuine reconciliation, which includes forgiveness, arrives at peace. And reconciliation is impossible <coughs> without dialogue. And I'll just leave you with a little saying of his. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, and thank you to all three speakers, really fascinating papers. What we're going to do now is open the door to discussion, but just before we do that, Christoph had asked me to make an announcement. Those of you who were here yesterday to hear my presentation, well, at least know who I am. I'm Marcus Harms, and I actually lecture here. Uh, Christoph, William, and I have been discussing the possibility that papers delivered at this two-day event could be drawn together into an edited collection, a uh, reviewed, peer-reviewed edited collection. We haven't taken the idea beyond that point thus far, but I wanted to flag it now in case it was of interest to some or many of the participants. And uh, we all have each other's email contacts, so it will be dialogue that we'll be able to pursue, perhaps um, with a set of editorial guidelines in due course as well. But I just wanted to mention that now in case it is of interest to and with that uh, word from our sponsors out of the way, I'd like to open the floor to questions to any or all of our three speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is for the Minister, uh, Robert Gaskell in Australia at Catholic University. Minister, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, my question relates to um, at least uh, prima facie uh, to my sense that there is a tension in the cultural diversity document. And I say that because um, the statement of vision, as you noted, does not include the term cultural diversity. 
uh, it emphasizes individuals and especially their economic success. Uh, and you know that the document is a document, not a welfare document. Whereas in the document as a whole, cultural diversity is noted. Uh, and I would think that includes recognition of the fact that, that we are not uh, simply individuals, but we're members of groups, we're formed by cultures, we have many aspects of our lives that are not purely e economic. Um, so that's a tension I see between the economic individual and the recognition of, of our rootedness in different cultures. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Try and do that as best as I can. Um, yeah, I, I guess I probably didn't explain it um, as, as best as I probably could have. Could have spent a little bit more time explaining um, that component of it. The, the vision statement at the front of it is, um, uh, I guess, relates to the government's vision for Queensland. Um, the document subsequent to that relates to uh, the, the cultural diversity policy. The vision uh, you suggest, uh, suggested is, um, refers to us as, uh, as individuals. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, with that view. I think um, how, how can we as a society uh, or as a government, how, how can we achieve uh, a harmonious society when we try to, um, try to create victims in what we do? How do we uh, try to um, achieve harmony in our society when we um, use language that is divisive or suggests division. So at the start of the document we tried to eliminate any kind of divisive language at all or any kind of um, uh, statement that implies division within our community. So we did refer to ourselves as just Queenslanders um, and that refers to all of us as a whole. It refers to our ethnicity, whatever that may be, it refers to the differences in our language, whatever that may be. It doesn't suggest individualism. Um, and despite the presence of the reference to um, participation in our economy, there is equal reference to uh, participation in our uh, vibrant society. Uh, so there's no uh, uh, specific um, uh, weighting towards one or the other. Um, so my comment, uh, I re I'll go back to my comment at the start, but yes, it's, it's not a welfare document, it's an economic document. It's not a document um, where we see, we didn't want to create a policy that tries to seek to identify victims of our, within our society to say, well, you're different and we need to look after you somehow, um, you know, saying, well, we need to come up with a funding program to look after the fact that somehow you're different to someone else in our society. We didn't want to do that at all. We wanted to say, well, this is our vision for, for Queensland, and these are, this is the way that we think we can get achieve that vision. So it's by, by making sure you can uh, have a solid foundation within the English language, it's by making sure that you have every opportunity to, to participate in our economy, it's by making sure that you've got really good access to education, and it's by making sure that you've got every opportunity to, to be a part of our community. Um, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't see it as, a, as an individualistic document at all, and, um, my comments to say that it was a, it was not a welfare document. Um, was was probably um, uh, uh, yeah, not a, not a fair statement. Um, it, I was uh, trying to suggest, um, uh, I guess, a divergence from from previous policy documents, um, which which did exactly that. They, they tried to, uh, I guess, in my view, uh, for political reasons, um, suggest that because someone was different from a white Anglo-Saxon in Queensland, therefore, uh, in order to, uh, I guess, to, to create a, a political opportunity, um, we need to identify a victim and therefore support that victim in, or, in order to support a political outcome. So I wanted to stay as far away from that kind of view as possible. Uh, Thank you. Yes. First of all, may I make a comment that is such insightful and thought-provoking <laughs> paper from all three speakers. But uh, I'm afraid my question will be for you again, Mister. 
Um, you mentioned about the state, multicultural state uh, policy as a departure from the previous government. So may I make an assumption here? Perhaps it didn't work very well with the previous government's paper and policy. What didn't work very well that we now move away from that in order to embrace a different view as you just mentioned? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, um, again, it comes down to, it's, it's not necessarily saying that the previous document didn't work well. The previous document was created for, I guess, the outcomes that the previous government was looking for. They're not the outcomes that we're looking for. We have a completely different view on it, and therefore we need a document that achieves the outcomes and objectives of the government. The previous document, you know, in, in reading and looking at it, just it almost says, like, you know, here's a whole bunch of problems in Queensland. We're all a bunch of racists, and we've all, we're all all of these things. And we're saying, well, no, we don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Queensland is filled with all of these problems within our culturally diverse communities. Uh, so for us, it was it had to be we wanted to create a positive document, mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, I guess again it was it comes back to that um, a document which creates victims or identifies victims. Mm -hmm. Now, well, I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to say well um, because you're uh, you know because you uh, you know might be. Uh, from a Philippine community that um, just arrived six months ago, and, and um, therefore, you know, let's let's identify all of these problems within your community. Well, yeah. no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, well, we understand that there are challenges for all of us. Uh, yeah. yeah. So does that mean that access and equity principle is still applicable? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear. That. <clears throat> so does that mean that principle of access and equity is still applicable? Well, that, that's the vision. The vision is to provide a quality of opportunity for all Queenslanders. It's, I think that you can't get any more, you can't get any more uh, in reference to equality than that. Yeah. It's to say, yeah, that's, that's why it's the singular statement in the front of the document. It's used to provide equality. It doesn't matter what you do or where you come from or whether you're a culturally diverse or not culturally diverse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the bishop and then what about? Uh, Minister, I'm pleased you're here, of course, with your presence here. Uh, the Roberts now outnumbers Brian, so I'm terribly sorry, Brian. Laura is here now. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that you know, a lot of these documents and policies are idealistic, which is you know, it's, it's great that we, we set these things. I was a little bit of a uh, question of English as a second language. That's something that's been around for you know, 30, 40 years, really. But I was really I'm interested in the fact that you've got a, an action plan to try and have a look at what the progress is happening. Of course, if the, so if these things are ongoing, I'm sure, and it will be interesting to have a look at you know, whether we're meeting targets of a pillow target set on all this, or, or just curious how that will work. Uh, well, that's, that's what's being developed over the next six months, the plan released by June 30, I believe. Um, well, I'm in the middle of constructing that document, so. To, to give you an answer is, is exactly how it's going to look is a little bit difficult at this stage, but it it does set out to, uh, I guess, uh, definitively uh, come up with ways of achieving uh, those those outcomes uh, right across government. And, um, we're, we're in the process now of, of not only coming up with the ideas as to how we're going to do it, we're, we're engaging quite heavily with all government departments to come back to us with ideas as well. Um, I guess it's a little bit of a shift from the previous structure of, of the department being um, sort of offshoots of other strange departments. Um, you know, at one stage, multicultural affairs was a part of the Department of Transport. Um, so now it's on its own and it's, um, it, it's very much moving towards being a, a centralised agency across government. And that policy document that we've written um, specifically states that it is a, a whole of government approach to to cultural diversity, so that means uh, all government departments will be responsible for achieving outcomes within their own departments. Um, so uh, there'll be a mix of a mix of everything. Um, so we're, we're going to try and do what we have to do in order to achieve the outcomes that we that we set out. Minister, uh, I'm for you again, uh, and I speak on behalf of one of the minority groups here. I'm the only Alan. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but I want to compliment you on that opening statement. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I didn't read individualism into it at all. Uh, I thought it was an excellent opening statement of what we should be getting for. I guess I can just say thank you. <laughs> that was the intention. <laughs> it has to be remembered that when comments or papers are presented by someone from the political world in, in this sort of a context, it has to be remembered that all governments have their priorities. And when you have a change of government, you have, you have a uh, different set of priorities. If you didn't have a different set of priorities, there's no point in changing government. The, the, the previous approach worked off uh, the concept of identifying problems real or imagined in various areas and then developing solutions to find those problems. That's one way of doing things. The ministers outlined a different way of doing things by working on the premise of finding things that are good about things and further developing them. That's a different approach. I just wanted to talk about Father Hall's uh, comments. Uh, it was a text of what he said. I, I put it in terms towards the end. He's uh, uh, I don't like it correctly. Confronting human greed and overcoming all evil. Or words to that effect, I thought he said. In the, in the rising tide of atheism, that seems to me to be the, the, the hope of all of this. That it's, it's the job of those who believe in Christianity or Hinduism or whatever else you care to believe in to uh, confront uh, these uh, the evils, the human greed and other evil and then show that atheism doesn't have the solution to those issues and demonstrate what religiosity has to offer and, de and, and prove our case. There's no need to just be moaning our situation about what we say is right and wrong. Rather, we've got to get on the front foot and, and say that uh, agnosticism or atheism has, has no real pathway ahead in life. It's only an observation. We'd be keen to hear your comments. Thank you. Um, Certainly, I think it, it's. The, I mean, there's a place, obvious. I mean, it, the dualism works at all sorts of levels, like rational thought or whatever. Like either God does exist or God doesn't exist. Either murder is defensible or it's not defensible. So, at, at the level of, um, if you like, intellectual reason, debate, etc., that's. I think that, that, that's, that's wonderful. If that happens. We discussed, but uh, with atheists, you know, the advantages of religion and why religion is right and atheism is wrong, etc. Absolutely. <clears throat> Certainly, what Pentecost is trying to do though is something a little different. Like he's actually trying to say, well, like in the end, all religions and atheism included, like we all hold mutually irreconcilable worldviews at certain points. But that's just reality, and it's the same between the, the Christians and the Buddhists or the Jews and the Muslims or whatever. But, but at a more profound level, we are we are united, and, and people from all, all those traditions, including the atheistic ones, will have contribution to make. And, and one of the contributions, I suppose, like in in one sense, like following the Enlightenment, and, and, and which I suppose atheism, in one sense, has taken over, mm. they, they they've picked up things like in terms of the emphasis on on justice and on individual rights, things of that nature. Now we might say, I would say, that they actually spring from a Judeo-Christian tradition. Absolutely. I would argue that, and I have. But they'd say, well, you didn't sort of show much attention to it for a few hundred years or something, you know? But in other words, it's, it's been the, the sense of the sacredness of the, of the secular reality that agnosticism, atheism, can contribute to the overall kind of discussion. So I agree that we can have that other debate, but at the level of achieving world peace, my main aim uh, would not be to, to be engaged in the discussion of proving atheism wrong, but of engaging with the atheist in order for his or her views to be in an approach to be integral to the solution. I just struggle to see what atheism has to offer, particularly in this justice area. Justice, justice is, a, is a concept that comes out of a, of a rational God, the goodness of, a, of, of the God of the Godhead. 
the, the very failure of communism with its atheistic failure, denying the essential nature of, of, of humanity. I, I don't know, I'm not saying you're advocating this, but I would want to uh, uh, elevate the, to the altars uh, agnosticism or atheism, as it, it, uh, though it's got a, a lot to offer. I, I, I would say that, that it's led us into materialism, into a wilderness. I, I think you've got to go back onto the front foot. We're going to prove our case that we, we don't deserve a living. We're going to sing for our suppers and explain what religiosity has to offer and how it can solve the problem. Don't worry about what atheists and agnostics can contribute. Yeah, no, contribute I, I, anything. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that, in a, in, in, too, in the sense that, in, in a sense, there's been a whole new kind of promotion of atheism mm. and, and religion. Yes, yeah, 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 some sort of legitimization of atheism. Is that what? Lucas, and then across the floor there. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. I'm very interested in this uh, observation, and I think. There is a problem in your question in case of the, on behalf of, you said, atheists or agnostic, they are, don't have nothing to contribute to the dialogue uh, in, in, in search of peace. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you saying that? Well, they, they, they work off. <coughs> Atheism works off a false premise. Okay. Uh, I mean, they, they might have ideas that resonate. In, in, with, with some measure of truth about them, but the premise, if you like, on, on which it's based is false. It yeah, must be false. Yes, well, well, well in, from the religious point of view, it must be false because it denies the, the, the nation of a supreme being. Now, I'm not saying that, that atheists are bad people, inherently bad. Everything they say is, is nonsense. But I'm just saying that the, the, the idea behind it, the ideas behind it, are, are founded on the ideas that we say are, are, are wrong, fundamentally wrong. That's all. I'm not even saying they're not good people, they're not capable, they, they have a conscience. This is the very point. They've got a conscience. Something must have prompted that conscience Conscience in the first place. We say that's the divinity that's put them up to that in the first place. Anyway, we're talking about it. Okay, okay. I, I only want to uh, apport this, that I think I saw in your chart 16% uh, of population uh, uh, atheist or uh, agnostic or non-religious and I think um, the inter-religious that uh, should include this was my presentation presentation yesterday because um, in the community they should be uh, representatives even if we are uh, wrong imagine well, I'm not sure even have uh, someone that believe in God that I'm I'm sure I have the right premises I'm not sure about Truth. So I think um, everybody, as a member of the community, should be representing people both um, and has uh, values and live a life that we can say is a healthy life. Maybe we can um, d disagree about those premises, but even with <coughs> those premises, you can get. Um, <coughs> A correct a conclusion, just by 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 uh, uh, as you mentioned, a non-realistic view. Because uh, <clears throat> if we are speaking about faith, uh, how we can uh, speak about um, rational conclusions from those premises? So I think when when we mix to the community life, we need to include those views and those abortations and those opinions, opinion, even as voices that we should respect. That's my invitation. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, with respect, Brian, I, I'd also like to uh, venture disagreement with, with what you said. Um, I don't think, I, I don't think uh, one can equate uh, atheistic communism based on Marxism and Leninism with atheism in a liberal society. For example, um, the work that is uh, recognised by many as the greatest work of political philosophy of the 20th century, John Rawls's A Theory of Justice, was written by an atheist. Rawls was a believing Christian before World War II. He lost his Christian faith during the Pacific War in World War II, uh, but wrote this great work together with a number of other outstanding works of social and political philosophy. Uh, and as a Catholic theologian, I want to say that 
it's part of the Catholic tradition that through natural law that uh, those who may not explicitly believe in God can still perceive fundamental moral values and articulate those and live by them. That's where they got them from, from God and nature, the natural law, the nature of humanity. Well, That's when of course, Christians believe mm -hmm. that uh, we receive everything from God. Mm -hmm. But I think that the question that we're looking at is whether or not someone uh, who does not explicitly believe in God uh, can still uh, believe in humanity and affirm the fundamental values of humanity. Uh, and it's part of the, the, the Catholic tradition that they can. And, and indeed, we have many extraordinary examples of that. And John Rawls's work is, is one prime example. I agree on that view. Did we have Brian yes. and then uh, Bishop Morris? Um, Bishop, are you wanting to comment on this continued discussion? Because I was peeling off of it a little bit. I was just going to make one comment and ask a question. Is that all right if you... Certainly. Uh, could you yeah. switch your microphone on too, please? Sorry. Uh, my, my, my comment was that uh, if, you, if you take anyone out of dialogue in the context, say, of the world, the world, if we're looking for peace, if you take anyone out, no matter what their belief or not belief is, then you'll never find peace. Because everyone is a part of that whole whole colourful, wonderful tapestry of life and everyone has a, has a role within that, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Catholic, whether you're not something, what, because they're all part of that extraordinary gift of creation and part of that sacredness of life. I don't want to take them out of the dialogue, I want to convert them. <laughs> they're part of the dialogue and if we're looking for peace, that's part. My question is to the Minister. <laughs> so, um, when you're developing those policies, one of the things that um, we, we found that when you move around, say, uh, many of the communities out west, where they work on these visas, you know, they come in to work on a three, five, four, five, four, five, four, five, five, five visa, and they're there for two years, and then they can say, depending on various conditions, they can apply for either extension and or maybe even citizenship. One of the difficult, one of the areas which I noticed in your policies was the importance of language, which is terribly important. One of the real vacuums in these small communities is for these people to be able to learn the English language, like the facilities of being able to be taught their language. And so that's one of the, one of the real difficulties for them. And um, it's, uh, so I was just wondering within the context of the development of those policies and looking at, say, you know, the, the wider community within Queensland, especially small communities and where these um, you know, migrants are coming to work for a particular time and wish to take it further, is there is there um, areas within your policy that's going to look at this particular problem, you think? Uh, yeah, of course. And um, that, that will come under the, the second part of the document, which is the, the action plan. So that um, we try to, uh, as I said, articulate and incorporate the elements of the Queensland plan, which were very much associated with regionalisation and, um, and, and placing out you know, new migrants in agrarian societies and rural communities. And um, so we, things like providing the ability to uh, improve the English languages in those communities is, is something that we're uh, very keen to look at how we might be able to uh, um, support them in, in that uh, in that endeavour. So absolutely, absolutely part of the process. Thanks, Mr. So if you've got any good ideas, I'm more than happy to hear. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Brian. Yeah. I had a, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, uh, Minister, thank you for uh, the presentation. I guess it's more, the comment comes in the form of a warning. It seemed in your presentation there is an equation of uh, difference to problems, and that uh, avoiding difference might allow us to avoid problems or focus on something that's more positive. And I would just say, uh, and, and pardon the assumption if that is incorrect, as well as my hubris in even giving you a warning. But uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, difference is important, and their difference aren't, aren't problems in that uh, we need to separate those two. I think we quite often talk in our society about difference as being an obstacle, meaning it is a problem to building our society, when in fact it it's actually contributes quite a bit to the beautiful, vibrant society that we have in, in Queensland. Um, and it may be unfair of me to then pass on to a question to the professor because I haven't allowed yeah, to comment. I'll just say I absolutely agree with you. I, it, the, the document is, is a lot more substantial than what I presented today, uh, clearly. So 
that. Um, but that, that's what we're trying to say. We, we, we're trying to say that um, uh, that we we absolutely love the fact that we uh, have these enormous differences in our society. We love the fact that there's you know, 200 different, 220 different cultures, 100 different religions, and 200 different languages. We absolutely love that, and that the very fact uh, that those differences exist is the very fact that why our society is so strong and why our economies are so strong. Um, we completely support that reality. Um, but focusing on the positives doesn't mean we're diminishing uh, those differences. I agree. It's the same in, in these religious dialogues. We're, we're, we've set aside that we haven't started these discussions with a long list of the differences between the different faith traditions. Rather, we're moving forward setting those differences aside. This is a similar thing to what the minister is yeah. trying to do. He's not starting off the checklist of what all the differences and all the problems are. We would again start this kind of dialogue here these last couple yeah, of days. Yeah, actually, I disagree, Brad. Right. We actually we haven't started off with a long list, but we have been happy to recognize and incorporate the differences. We haven't set them aside. Well, I think the minister, minister's not pretending everything's perfect. I'm not here to paddle his canoe for him, but he's a bit <laughs> not a bit, but the, the thing he's not starting off to say that there aren't any problems. And minister, right, do you, you want to draw our attention? Oh, I was just saying, the, very, the front cover of it says, Queensland Cultural Diversity Policy, Queensland Rich in Our Diversity. Mm. So it's, it, it's very, it very much, I just encourage you to, to read it, I guess, and, uh, and uh, then, uh, then make up your own mind after that, that process takes place. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'm just uh, naturally a, a person who views things in a positive light. I don't tend to focus on the negative. So um, uh, the, the document is just a reflection of, of the, my positive view on, on our state and our society. So uh, I, in order to get a, a better understanding of the document's intent, you know, just uh, have a good read and then call me to discussion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we keep meeting up, so I'm sure there'll be, yeah. other, there'll be other opportunities. Um, and I'm cognizant of having taken a lot of time with that. Is it okay if I ask the question as well? Certainly. Okay. Well, Professor uh, Matorovic, is there, I think we have an interesting opportunity here, because we've been given uh, a new policy, and you have, in fact, discussed a framework or an approach to engaging with uh, migrant communities um, and the cultural needs of the, of the new immigrants. Is there any way that, um, in looking at this policy applied from the framework, how would it work given the, the information you've given us, the framework you've given us? Is there, is there coherence between them? Would it be challenging to meet the needs? I mean, I, I realize you're about to retire, so you can speak probably more <laughs> openly. <laughs> I would say that we can develop the policy a little bit in the future. I, I'm not sure about the process of con consultancy. The, the previous document was probably well consulted, and, and, and perhaps uh, it's, I have passed the question to, to minister about the process for consultation, and, and certainly I'm sure the minister understands pro problems of my guilt because, for example, his own experience. Um, well, yeah, we took into consideration the, the extraordinary amount of information that came from previous consultations. Um, and since coming to government, um, I know many of you by virtue of the fact that um, I attended you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, direct community events and consulted with them exactly on their needs and um, the, the barriers and, and uh, the issues facing their communities. Uh, so there's only so much consultation you can do uh, before you, you physically have to act. Um, we spent two years consulting in that way, taking into consideration the previous amount of consultation. So the, I was satisfied that we consulted uh, enough with those communities and it was um, it was the, the right time to, to release our, our views on uh, cultural diversity. So, um, uh, you know, holding another 20 community forums and hearing the same thing as what they said, you know, two weeks ago or a year ago, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a fruitless exercise. So um, uh, I thought I had uh, uh, enough of an understanding of of the issues facing those communities to proceed with uh, the document. Are there, are there any further questions for any of our three speakers? Yeah. Can I ask uh, uh, Revlon, uh, 
Paul a question because I like your talk. Uh, you talk about the inner peace. I would like to know more about how can we uh, obtain the inner peace. Thank you. Well, the first thing I would do to answer that question is consult my uh, local Buddhist spiritual director, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I say more about inner, inner peace? Well, <clears throat> like the example I was giving, and this is so ha often happened with religions in a way, that uh, like if you follow our faith, whether it's a Christian or the Muslim or the Buddhist or whatever, you can achieve like a deep sense of fulfillment and happiness and inner peace. Uh, but if you don't follow us, well, we're going to dragoon you, convert you, or perhaps even kill you because you know, we, we don't accept people. So that's our, that, that's, the, that, that's sort of looking at inner peace as distinct from outer peace. So it's the peace within oneself and one's community as distinct from this outer peace, which is well, the global kind of idea of peace. Is that, is that what you meant by the question? I, I might have misunderstood. Yeah, um, then, okay. You talk about the inner peace within your community, is that what you mean? Or? Yeah, within my community or within my soul. Oh, I, I will talk about more about myself, how to seek for the inner peace in, in the in the victory. Yeah. Yes, yes, please do. Would you like to? Oh, I, I thought we want to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for our inner peace, more about uh, we have uh, the Buddha, Buddhism will talk about the three learning from discipline. Discipline is the means uh, to um, follow the precepts that is do all that is good, do nothing that is bad. Then we, the next step, we do the meditation, the seek more about inner peace. It's only when we discipline ourselves, do all that is good, uh, nothing that is bad, then we can really go the higher levels in the peace. That is the meditation. Through meditation, we uncover our true wisdom and then we call the Buddha nature. That is our process. So I would like to know more about it. Uh, in the Catholic uh, phase, uh, how you get your inner peace. I want to learn more about that. Well, there are a few other okay. No, I do wonder if the inner peace that um, Reverend Paul mentioned is similar to Buddhism enlightenment. It is something that you can get it from outside. It is something that is come from you, and you won't be able to open up until you get to a certain level where you uh, have a certain understanding and know yourself, know the word, is a kind of self I, enlightenment? I wonder if this might be a discussion that could profitably, profitably done over lunch, as I see it's one o'clock and I, yes. that is the correct time for breaking with it. That is. All right, well, could you join with me again, please, in thanking our three uh, speakers?